Good afternoon. Welcome to the webinar. In this opportunity, this, the speaker Alejandro Acosta will be talking about IPv6 transition mechanisms. Um, Sorry. Here uh, is the agenda for the activity. After this brief introduction, we'll be starting, and the presentation will last for approximately 50 minutes. And the webinar will be recorded, so in the next day, you will be able to access the video. There will be a question and answer session after the presentation. Then please feel free to write your question or comment in the section at the bottom of the screen. And you see it. Uh, shall we start, Alejandro? Okay. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Thanks, Mariela, for the introduction. And well, thanks everybody for, for being here today. Well, today, as Mariela said, we're going to talk about transition mechanisms, okay? Basically, we're going to talk about moving from IPv4 to IPv6. Okay, this is the content, the agenda for today. We're going to talk a lot about different transition mechanisms. I am not going to even read the agenda because I need to save this, I need to save time for, for, the, for the rest of the webinar. Okay, basically I want to, to tell you a few things. As you know, in this moment, most of the internet is running over IPv4. That is just fine. However, as you also know, we are running out of IPv4 addresses, so we need to move to IPv6. Having said that, it is, it is very important to keep in mind that there will be several years that we're going to have IPv4 and IPv6 at the same time running in the network, running in internet, running in our own network. That is quite important to keep in mind. Uh, basically, uh, and I, I, I always like to say this because when we go, for example, to a webinar like this or to an IPv6 training, the people start talking about transition mechanisms and many times the speaker does not even stop explaining what a, a, a transition mechanism is about. Basically, what we're looking for in a transition mechanism is achieving IPv6 connectivity and also we need to provide a solution for the shortage of the IPv4 addresses. Okay, that is basically the two main goals of the transition mechanism. Uh, if we think about the different transition mechanisms that exist today, I am going to explain several of them in few in few minutes, we can in somehow divide them in three different categories. Okay, basically, let's begin with native IPv6. This one is very important for me uh, that you are aware of what a native IPv6 is. Okay, basically, when we talk about native IPv6, we are talking about moving IPv6 packets with any, any kind of translation and with any type of tunneling, okay? Uh, tunneling is basically putting one IP version, suppose IPv6 over IPv4, or the other way around, putting IPv4 over IPv6, okay? That is what we are talking about tunneling. You can and that is a very good approach to think about tunneling like you think about DPNs. It is more or less the same. However, as you know, DPNs usually have hashing and encryption. In tunneling, 
that is not always the case. And translation, this is something very important for me, for you to know, is that you cannot have an IPv4 host that can talk directly to an IPv6 host. If you need an IPv4 host to talk with an IPv6 host, you will need some sort of translation in the middle. And we are going to cover more in detail about translation, okay? Something that also uh, is quite important to, to keep in mind is that you can mix all these techniques. I mean, you can have tunneling plus translation, you can have native IPv6 in a tunnel and that kind of thing. You can mix those techniques in any way, okay? Uh, there is not like one solution for everything. It will always depend in what you have in your network. Okay, um, I already said about this, what is an IPv6 transition mechanism. I also want to tell you that the very common and very popular NAT, network address translation, some people believe or think about NAT like being a transition mechanism, it is not, okay? Network address translation is not an IPv6 transition mechanism. Why not? Because actually we are not moving to IPv6. If in somehow I have a translation that helps me to go to IPv6, it makes sense. However, the, tra the traditional NAT that we're using, for example, in our home, in our company, that is not a transition mechanism. Okay. <clears throat> One more time, Tunnel is to encapsulate one version of IP protocol in another one. And the goal when I have a tunnel is, for example, suppose I, I have an IPv4 only network in my core and I need to move IPv6 packets and for any reason I do not want or I cannot change the software in my routers, for example, I will need to put a tunnel. What is going going to happen, the core network is not going to, to even realize that IPv6 packets are going over it, okay? That's the, the goal of a tunnel. There are many several types of tunnels in this slide. We're mentioning static versus automatic tunnels. Basically, we usually use static tunnels we do not want to have automatic tunnels in general. Sometimes automatic tunnels are not good, are not good for security. I can have point-to-point -point tunnels, to point to multi-point tunnels, and that kind of things. Basically, what I want you to, to, to take with you is the concept of tunnel. Okay? Here, you can see different things that I can have. I can have IPv6 going over IPv4. I can have GRE over IPv4, this means generic route encapsulation, and over GRE I can put IPv6, I can have IPv4, then I can put UDP over IPv4, and then I can have IPv6, and I have the something that is getting every day more popular, that is I can have my network in IPv6, and I am going to put IPv4 over it, okay? And regarding translation, uh, I need to put a translator Translator, if I need to, to put, for example, IPv6 host to talk with I, another IPv4 host or with another IPv4 network. I need to put a translator. If I have a host that, can, that only speak, speaks IPv6, it cannot talk with IPv4 host, okay? So please keep that in mind. A uh, long time ago, there was a protocol which was called NAT-PT, Network Address Translator, Protocol Translator. This is now obsolete. It was substituted by basically two new mechanisms that I am going to, to mention in the next slides. Okay. Okay, one more time. Native IPv6. Native IPv6 means having IPv6 without encapsulation or translation. 
that is basically native IPv6. There are a lot of advantages when talking about IPv6, native IPv6, this is the final solution. And somehow everybody, everybody is going to move in, that, in this direct, direction. This is the way to go, to have native IPv6 in my host. One more time, it is, a, it is solid and stable. Um, in the future, you won't need to, to make any major changes in your network. If you're going, if you need, if you're going to take a decision in this, no, in, this, in this moment, this is the way to go, okay? Uh, to make native IPv6 in your network, basically you have two options. You have the dual stack method that basically, suppose you have, you have an, IP, an IPv4 network in this moment, you are going to put another stack of IP on this network. In the very same network that you have in this moment, it suppose the campus of a university, you have your network up and running with IPv4, now you're going to put IPv6. And you can have IPv6 only. It means that you are not going to have IPv4 in that network, okay? In both networks, you are going to have IPv6 and you can have a native IPv6 in dual stack. Um, if you have dual stack, now let's talk about dual stack, you basically are going to have a more friendly option, like a more secure, at least from an application perspective, a way to go. Uh, all your applications are going to work perfectly. So most people is doing dual stack in this moment, okay? At least in, in networks where you have people. <laughs> of course, you, you, if someone, if you have a network that has a lot, several things up and running, you want to have the same with the same feature, features that you have in this moment or more or better. Okay. Uh, the slide by basically is telling us that you can have IPv4 and IPv6 and the way that it's going to connect with other networks. Uh, it is important you to be aware that in the data plane of the devices, there, there are not problems. But if you talk about the control plane, sometimes I, I am not going to say there is a problem. However, it is more, more, complex, more complex and more expensive to manage. Be aware of that. Basically, the slide that you have in front of you is trying to explain how the computers connect when you need, suppose you are in a, in a host that has IPv4 and IPv6 and needs to connect to another host that has IPv4 and IPv6, okay? I'm going to skip the rest of this slide because in the next one is uh, explained even better. Why? And I will stop here to explain in detail this part. In the initial movement of the world going to IPv6, when you had a host with IPv4 and an IPv6 and wanted to open, suppose, a web page in a server that also was in IPv4 and IPv6, your computer was going to try to connect first with IPv6. And only if the connection failed with IPv6, the computer was going to fall back to IPv4. It sounds good. However, from a pers performance perspective, that is not good. Why? Because you needed to, to wait for the IPv6 to connection to fail to go to IPv4. So what are hosts doing in this moment? What is the current situation today in September 2019. The hosts are going to run an algorithm called Happy Eyeballs. Basically, Happy Eyeballs, what it's going to do, it will try to connect using the best path or the best protocol possible. So I have my computer and I need to open YouTube, Google, Yahoo, Netflix, all of them are IPv6 and IPv4 capable. My host is going to try to connect using both protocols, IPv4 and IPv6, and it will connect with the fastest protocol possible. So the user is going to get the best, the best 
possible performance. If you take a look of what is going on in the slide, basically I have a client which makes a, a DNS request for www.example.com. It is going to receive an IPv4 and an, I, and an IPv6 address, and the client is going to connect to the server to the server using both protocols. The one that responds fastest is, is the one that he is, it is going to use. Okay. Um, the, okay. Now that we talk about IPv about dual stack, let's try to talk or recap IPv6 only. Basically, uh, the idea is to have an IPv6 only network. It is, why? Because I do not have enough public IPv4 addresses. In an IPv6 only network, it is easier to manage. If I have IPv4 and IPv6, I need to manage two networks. If I have only IPv6, it is much easier, okay? And implementation is somehow are valid forever. Okay? This is an IPv6 only. Not everybody is using IPv6 only in a network because sometimes very few applications are going to fail. Okay? So I need to be aware of that. If I have an IPv6 only network, few applications can fail. Um, However, I could have an IPv6 only network in the core of the network. However, but I can have, for example, different transition mechanisms over open my IPv6 only network. For example, I could have DS Lite, I could have NAT64, DNX64, and many more that I'm going to mention just in a few slides ahead. Um, okay. I already mentioned this slide. Okay. I want to tell you, for example, a tunnel which is called six in four. This one is very, very common. And basically what I'm going to, to do is to put an IPv6 traffic, IPv6 packets in IPv4 packets. Right? But basically the payload of an IPv4 packet is IPv6. Um, here, for example, you, you can see I have a dual stack network on my end. The middle of the di diagram of the topology is only IPv4, and I have IPv6 on the very right of the diagram. You can see that I can have IPv6 traffic going just over IPv4, and this is something that is going to work just fine. This kind of tunnel, traditionally speaking, is static. Traditionally, every, all the configuration is going to be static. For example, the red dots that you can see, in, in this one I need to say, this is my end point. And on this red circle, I need to say, this is my end point. I need, I need to configure like, if you are going to move IPv, IPv6 traffic, the tunnel destination is this one. And in this red circle, you have to to put exactly the, the opposite. If you are going to reach this network, please send the traffic through the tunnel all the way until I get this red circle here. Okay, now that we know about tunneling, I want to tell you, uh, actually I like a lot this transition mechanism. It is called 6RD. It was very popular in the, in the past. A lot of people are still using it. Uh, it is called 6RD, which means IPv6 rapid deployment, okay? Uh, in the slide, you can see that it was developed by a French ISP. All the technical detail, details are specified in RFC, the request for comment 5569. It only took six weeks for deployment. Basically, they, they took another transition mechanism, which was 6 to 4. They work on that transition mechanism and develop 6RD. Basically, to implement 6RD, you need a CPE, which supports 6RD, and another device in the core of the network, which is called Relay, which is uh, Relay 6RD. Six, uh, the Relay 6RD basically are very few commands that you're going to put in a router. 
uh, you can have the CP can be anywhere. It can be in XDSL modem, in GPON, in cable modems, in 3G, 4G, in almost any device. And the Relay 6RD, basically any router is able to, to do it. And basically the work is to encapsulate and unencapsulate packets. Here is a very simplistic di diagram of how everything works. You have a host on your left, which IPv6 and IPv4 address. He's going to send a packet. The router is going to, to look, oh, this is an IPv6 packet. And it is going to put everything in a tunnel, which is called tunnel 6 over 4. It will end in the relay. It will remove everything that, is, that corresponds to IPv4 and send it to the IPv6 internet. Um, of course, if the packet that was sent by this host on the left is IPv4, the packet is going through the regular IPv4 network, okay? This is the way 6RD works. Now I want to tell you about, I put this DS slide and I put a 6RD back to back because they are basically the same, but they do it in a different way. But if I already explained, 6RD to understand this slide is quite easy. Why? Because it is exactly the same. However, instead of having an IPv4 network in the middle, in the core, I am going to have an IPv6. And the host are going to be IPv6 and IPv4. When I mention host, I'm telling you the host of, uh, suppose you have a GPON network. You, you are running a wireless network for customers. These end users are this kind of people. So you are going to have a dual stack network here. You are going to have a B4. This is the, the name of the bridge device that is used here. The transport will be done all the way using IPv6. I have uh, another box here, which is called AFTR, Address Family Transition Router, is the, is, uh, are the letters that stand for AFTR. And then I'm going to have my, my IPv4 and, I'm, and my IPv6 internet. If I go to IPv6, it is my regular IPv6 network. However, if I go to an IPv4 destination, the traffic needs to go, for example, through the other family transition router, okay? This is basically how DS Lite works and works quite nice, okay? Many people is using, using. here is a, a, like a very detailed way how everything is going to be done. I have a source address <clears throat> here, excuse me. I have an IPv4 address here, which is 10.002. I cannot put 10.002 over my IPv6 traffic, so I needed to put it through an IPv6 tunnel. Okay, source, IP, like here, everything, every example, source IPv4, destination IPv4. You can see how the traffic was tunnel. Of course, if I have a private IPv4 address, I will need to make a translation on my edge so it can reach the it can reach public IPv4 addresses in the network. Traditionally speaking, these addresses are going to be shared among all my DS Lite network. Okay, now let's move to translation. One more time, uh, IPv4 nodes and IPv6 nodes cannot talk each other. I need a device in the middle that is going to, to make the translation that will be able to make both hosts to talk each other. I have an IPv4 host that needs to talk with an IPv6 host. You can see it. The up left is an IPv4 host. It needs to talk with an IPv6 host. 
I need a translator in the middle. Talking about translator, this is not something quite difficult. This is not something difficult. There are several devices out there that perform translation. And there are, uh, there are a lot of free software that is able to make this, okay? Uh, IPv4 cannot talk with an IPv6, okay? And, and now you will see why I was being so emphatic in, in this concept, okay? Now, uh, now that we know that IPv4 host cannot talk with IPv6 host, let's talk about NAT64 and DNS64. NAT, as all of you know, means network address translation. 64 means from IPv6 to IPv4, and also the other way around, from IPv4 to IPv6. And DNS64 is a technique where an IPv4, sorry, where an IPv6 only host can receive IPv, IPv6 answers. Okay. Users share public IPv4 addresses. The translation is, of course, automatically. There is, and this is very important, a well-known prefix for NAT64 and DNS64. It is a known prefix. It is not a mandatory prefix. Having said that, you could use your own IPv6 network. I mean, your own IPv6 prefix. However, if you ask me, I fully recommend to use the well-known prefix. Sometimes the devices will want to understand if, sorry, the devices will want to know if they are actually in a NAT64 or DNX64 environment. One way of doing that is trying to see if known prefixes are used. For example, this known prefix, which is 64 colon FF9B colon colon slash 96. If you use your own prefix, the devices probably won't be able to identify that they are actually in a NAT64 and DNS64 environment. Basically, what we're trying to achieve with NAT64 and DNS64 is trying to create connectivity in an IPv6 only island, in an IPv6 only network to IPv4. That is the goal of NAT64. NAT okay. Um, in this slide, you can, you can see IPv6 only nodes. Most believe that IPv4 only nodes are reachable via IPv6. How a computer that only has IPv6 address will reach an IPv4 destination. You need him somehow to, to tell a lie to the host. You cannot, why? If I have a host that is in an IPv6 only environment, it, it will try to search for an IPv6 address. But now suppose that the destination is an, an IPv4 only host. It, it will be impossible for the IPv6 only, for the IPv6 only host to reach the IPv4 only host. The DNS is going to create a false response based in the IPv4 address of the destination. So the IPv6 only host will be able to reach that IPv4 only host, okay? Um, it sounds more or less complex, however, it is quite easy. Uh, in order to make it, try to more than, in order to explain more about this, I will try to, to give you more context. Basically, what is going to happen is that the DNS is going to search to query the destination IPv4 only host. He's going to receive an IPv4 address. So far, so good. 
is going to take that IPv4 address that corresponds to the IPv4 only host and is going to embed that IPv4 address in an IPv6 address. How it is going to do that? IPv4 addresses are 32 bits long, right? It's going to use this very well-known prefix, for example, this prefix, which is only a slash 96, and he's going to add the 32 bits of the destination address, which is IPv4, so the destination now from the IPv6 only host will be this address, 64 colon FF9B, plus the 32 bits of the destination host. This is exactly the way how it works, okay? You can use, for example, Joule, you can use, for example, Exodus, you can use, for example, Taiga to make this happen. DNS 64, uh, Alejandro, are you there? We apologize. I think Alejandro have a problem. In few minutes, Alejandro, connect again. Please wait for him. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Oh. Sí, Alejandro, oh. sí, te estamos esperando, no te preocupes, nos dimos cuenta que tuviste un problema. Adelante. Dale, gracias. Okay, thank you and sorry for that for for I really don't know what happened. Maybe an IPv4 only network is causing this mess. Well, well, anyhow, I was trying to tell you uh, here is an example how everything works. You can you can see that uh, on the on the left, I have an IPv6 network, which is IPv6 only, and it is going to send this query, www.example.com, and it is going to send the query to a DNS64 server. Alejandro, can you yes? share the screen, please? Ah, okay. Of course. Uh, Yes. Yes, it's, it's okay. Okay, thank you. Okay, one more time. I will try to recap this situation. Uh, this topology on my left, I have an IPv6 only network and he, and he needs to, to reach IPv4. Okay, let's only mention that. I will send a query basically to a DNS64 server. Please note that this is not a regular DNS server. Um, in this moment, uh, there are a lot of DNS64 servers available in internet for free. You can download them, install it, or you can even use the servers that are freely available like other public DNS servers. So you go to the server, uh, the server this is a recursive DNS server. He's going to send the same query that you, that you just sent to him. He's going to go to another DNS server and he's going to receive an IPv4 only answer. And here is the magic. You can see that this address now of the destination now becomes 64FF9B colon colon 
and the red letters or digits are basically this address embedded. And the answer that is given to the host on the left, the host that started everything, will be a quad A, which means an IPv6 address. For him, he's not going to even notice that, it, that it, he's connecting to an IPv4 destination. For him, it's like, well, I'm going to connect to this destination, which is IPv6, so for me, everything is fine, okay? He's going, in this case, he's going to send a TCP SIM packet, it could be a UDP or, or other stuff, okay? This is the way NAT64 and DNS64 works. If you see in the middle, this, there is a box called NAT64, he will be able to know that this destination is IPv4, how? Based on the well-known prefix. Every destination that goes to this prefix, to 64 colon FF9B, is going to remove the IPv6 part, and he is going only to use the red digits, which are the IPv4 destination. This is how NAT64 identifies when he needs to remove. If for any reason, an IPv6 packet goes through this, to this um, path, but the destination is, does not belong here, he's not going to perform the NAT64 mechanism, okay? In somehow, there are some limitations for NAT64. Uh, uh, for example, it only works with unicast. In case you have multicast, it is not going to work. It is, this is not going to work. There are some applications that probably need to, to modify. Sometimes layer seven up, uh, information is needed. So very few things could be broken using this technique. But in somehow, Believe me, if you put a NAT64, DNS64 network, most of the time everything is going to work. Okay, now that we know about NAT64, we can talk about 464XLAT. This one is a very beautiful implementation of the NAT64 and DNS64. What is, uh, why I'm going to tell you this. I already told you that few applications could fail in the, if you have an IPv6 only network. One more time, we are talking in this moment about users. Suppose I am using Zoom to open a webinar and I am in IPv6 only network. Maybe Zoom is not going to fail, but other applications could fail. What happened? 464 XLAT is the right solution for these situations, okay? 464 is glad, traditionally, well, in, in the moment, it began in the cell, in the cell, cellular network. However, today it is very, very common to, to use in many other topologies and network, and different networks. Okay. What happened with 464XLAT? I have, a software which is called CLAT, Customer Site Translator, okay? What is going to use this CLAT? Oops, sorry, what is going to do this CLAT? This CLAT is going to install a very small dummy logical interface on the device. Why? Because it is an IPv6 only network, however, the CLAT is going to put an IPv4 address in that host. So if an application for any reason needs an IPv4 socket, it will be given by the CLAT and everything is going to work in that device. And actually that is the reason why sometimes some applications fail in IPv6 only networks. One more time, the CLAT is going to provide an IPv4 socket for, for the applications in the host. That is what the CLAT does. And there is another device in this topology, which is called the PLAT. The PLAT basically 
translate everything that is coming from the cloud and can be sent to IPv4 destinations. Okay, this is the cloud. Of course, this is, for example, in my cell phone, in the CP in my home, in a software inside my operating system, and the ply and the plat is a is a box. Basically, the plat what what it makes is NAT64. Okay. Here is a explanation of what I just said. Uh, you can see that on the left there is a, a mobile phone. Everything is started here, and if you are if, if you are listening to me and you are running a a, self, a cellular network and you want to implement IPv6, you should probably you should use this mechanism. It works quite nice. Uh, one more time on the left, I have a, a mobile phone. It is trying to reach this. Everything goes just fine. However, if for any reason the application in the mobile phone needed uh, IPv4 socket, it was provided. It, remember, this is a, a dummy interface. It will be provided by, by the CLAT. The CLAT is a very small library that is installed on the mobile. It takes just a little bit over 20 Ks, 20 kilobytes. And it goes through the mobile network using IPv6. This is basically what I want you to note. The transport of the IPv4 traffic is over IPv6. So the, the maintainer, the administrator of this network only have to pay attention to the IPv6. Uh, for example, access list, NAT, routing, passwords, username, IP addresses. I do not mind, there is not IPv4 here. So to manage this network is easier than if it were dual stack. So uh, it goes through the cloud, it performs some sort of translation, it puts everything IPv6 network and the plat remove everything with IPv6 and takes the traffic to the IPv4 internet, okay? Now, I am almost about to finish. I want to talk to you about CDC. Uh, CDC stands for Stateless IP ICMP Translations for IPv6 data centers environments. Uh, what is CDC? CDC basically is trying to create connectivity in your data center, which is in the which is IPv6 to the IPv4 only world. Today there is a tendency that data centers are going to IPv6 only environments. It is quite common, it is well known. I am going only I am going only to mention Facebook because it is quite public. Most, 90, 90, mo, over 90, 90% 90 of the Facebook data centers are over IPv6 only. Uh, and now, they, a lot of people in the world are building their the, the new data centers in an IPv6 only environment. So basically what is going to happen, you are going to have your data center, which is IPv6 only. All your network is also IPv6 only. And you need, of course, connectivity to the IPv4 only world, okay? For example, ISPs that have not deployed IPv6, you need connectivity to them, of course. I want to mention something very beautiful <laughs> that wh why CDC got developed is because of the evolution of the data centers. Long time ago, we had IPv4 only data centers. And somehow I used later proxies to have IPv6 connectivity. Now we are moving, now we are not users, we are data centers. Uh, be careful that both scenarios are different. So uh, after proxies, uh, there was a time where I use in my data center dual stack, and now we are going to move to IPv6 only. And actually, IPv6 only data centers are more faster than IP, are more faster, no, are faster than IPv4 data centers. Uh, 
a lot of measurements have been done, have been done all around that show that IPv6 is faster than IPv4. So if you are building your data center in this moment, it could be a good, a good idea to use seed DC. Uh, well, uh, basically what is going to happen, one more time, I have my data center on the, on the left, which is IPv6 only. Now I'm going to have a translation in the middle, a translator, which is basically the seed. Uh, we traditionally recommend a software called Joule. It is developed in, in Mexico by the NIC Mexico and it works extremely well. So I, I, I would recommend it to you very, very for sure. Uh, CDC is defining RFC 7755. Uh, I want to tell you that the translation in CDC happens in a table. The table is called EAM, it is explicit, explicit address mapping. You can map one by one, or you can map a full prefix to another prefix. The most important part is that the prefix in the IPv6 network should be bigger than the prefix in the IPv4 network, which makes sense. You can have, for example, an slash let's say 27 in the IPv4 network, and you can map everything to a slash 64 on the IPv6 network. And one more time, you can map one host here to another host here. Okay, here uh, on, on your upper right, you can see a few important things. The translation happening at the IP header. Also, I see MP, I see MP is also translator. It is important to know that every uh, over layer three, layer four, um, is copied verbatim exactly. So, for example, if you were transporting TCP, that packet is not going to be translated. This kind of translation is based in a stateless. Okay, actually, some people call SEED like a NAT64 stateless. Okay, in case you you see it in some somewhere else. That is a, a way to call it. And I like to mention the stateless because suppose you had a path going this way, I mean, on, on the up of the topology, and probably the return traffic wants to come in the down part of the topology, that can happen easily because it is a stateless. So you could have a lot of different redundancy devices doing very good things and you can have a very high tolerant network. Uh, if, you, if you want to mention a few things that are bad about this kind of translations, it, it happened more or less the same in the regular NAT. Uh, it only works on Unicast. For me, it, may, it, is, it is not bad, it makes sense to me. Uh, is in case you are handling IPv4 options, which is, are very rare to, to use, uh, they are not going to be translated. And also with, the, with some extension, extension headers for IPv6 cannot also be translated. But I can tell you in your, most of the time everything is going to work here. Very, very exceptional cases, something is going bad. Here is an example of how everything works. Here is the, an explicit address mapping table. You can, you can see the entry number, IPv4 prefix, the IPv6 prefix, uh, more or less how the translation is done. And you can see that you have in this one, a, a one host only, a slash, six, a slash 32, mapped to an slash 128 in case uh, the mask in this case is not specified. Uh, that is, it will assume that this is slash 32. In the same IPv6 prefix, uh, it is considered a slash 128. And let's see. Well, this is all what I have, Mariela. Uh, yes, okay. yes, Alejandro, we have some questions. And 
And let me see. A question from Dalia. Dalia says, for the implementation to be dual stack, the IPv4 and IPv6 addresses must be configured on the same DNS server, or it is recommended that the implementation be done on separate, separate servers? Uh, well, thank you for that question. If you ask me, I do not recommend to separate the configuration. I fully recommend you to have, if you have already configured your DNS in a server, which is IPv4, use that one for IPv6. Probably, if you ask me that question 10 years or 15 years ago, I would not say that. But today, everything is going to work and no panic that you are going to, to break anything. Everything is going to work. Okay, thank you, Alejandro. We have another question. Uh, Fernando says, uh, what, do, what to do in NAT64 scenarios when a user may need to establish a connection which is not TCP UDP or ICMP, which which is which is not this. Uh, well, I am trying to think, and for example, I, I'm trying to think about that scenarios. And if 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 you need that to happen, unfortunately, NAT64 is not the solution for you. NAT64 is only going to work going forward and coming backwards for IPv4 and IPv6 packets. If you need something else, unfortunately, that is not going to, to work. If you are talking probably about layer four packets, suppose a routing protocol that goes over IPv6 or IPv4, um, I have not done that. Unfortunately, uh, that could be a, a cool case to test. But unfortunately, I have not done that. I have not, 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 I have not needed to do that. Um, if, you, if you want, we can try to talk later about this. Do not hesitate in contacting me. And we can try to take a deeper look to your, to your case. Okay, um, the next question is, can you also configure a NAT64 translator to share a single IPv4 among multiple IPv6 only users? Oh, that's a, a very good question. Actually, generally speaking, that is the way the people configure NAT, uh, NAT64. You are going to share an IP. A one, you are going to share one IPv4 address among many IPv6 only users. Uh, that is the typical scenario. However, uh, you can do it the other way. Uh, you could have like a static routing or only one NAT per host. You can do that. Everything that you do after the NAT64 finishes is up to you. Um, but well, one more time, generally speaking, that's the way that people do it. Okay, uh, we have a comment and a question too. Say, hi, so from your point of view, the better approach to a new migration should be a dual stack? Depends on, the, on your network size, but most of the time I'm going to say yes, dual, dual stack is your friend, everything is going to work, the only cons that you can find when talking about dual stack is the redundancy of your tasks. What, 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 I, what, I, what I mentioned with this, what I want to say with this is, is the following. The problem with, with dual stack, why, the people, why many people is not doing dual stack is because if you have a very large network and you have, suppose, dozens, hundreds of devices in your network, 
and you have dual stack, you will need an IPv4 and an IPv6 address per device. And th th that is a, a tough task. And suppose you have something very easy to say. You have an access list that only allows SSH from certain, certain IPs. And later, two months later, you want to add a new network for SSH. You will need to modify that access list, which is IPv4 and IPv6 per device. And that is a, a very tough task, a time consuming task. Okay, having said this, if your network is relatively small, dual stack is the way for you. Do it uh, and you can be sure that everything is going to work. That's it, Mariela. Okay, we have two questions. Um, Donovan say, what would be the first step an ISP could have to take to migrate to IPv6, especially if the core is multi-operator op operator environment? Well, I, I think the question is about the steps that probably an ISP or, an, or another entity should take when moving to IPv6. Um, I'm going to tell you at least three steps. Generally speaking, the people, when it's going to deploy IPv6, the people start in the edge of your network. For example, in the routers that face your upstream providers, that is the a typical way to start. In that routers, for example, you can announce your IPv6 prefix, you can ask for IPv6 connectivity to your upstream providers, you can configure at least the, the beginning of everything. After you configure the edge, you should try to move, for example, to the distribution layer, okay? In case you call it distribution, but going more to your core of your network. In that case, you can start configuring, for example, switches, LAN switch. Um, you can start having your initial uh, dynamic routing protocol for IPv6, like RIPNG, USPF version 3, ISIS, or any other one that you have. And after you finish in your distribution, then you go to your access layer, where it's probably where you have your servers, where you start connecting your users, where you have probably your Wi-Fi, and, and so on. In that case, you now you configure IPv6 in your access and you start actually giving IPv6 access to your servers, to your users, and the rest of your network. Please take in account, uh, please consider that you need security, you need stability, you do not need to do everything from one day to the other one. We traditionally suggest you can do, for example, the border, the edge of your network one day, you can leave it like that. Maybe some weeks later, you can go to the, the distribution layer. You can do that. Maybe some weeks later, then you do your access layer. Um, if you are constant, you are going to have IPv6 in your network in a matter of a few months. Okay. Uh, we have three, the, the, the last three questions. Um, Jose Luis Purita says, hi, if I want to deploy a 464X LATS in an ISP mobile network, how can I know how many user equipments or CPE in my network do support CLAT features. Currently, there are some kind of list with this information about final user terminals. That's a very good and important question for, um, I can tell you that there are a lot of information if you search for it in Google, and your question is fully, fully valid. Um, I'm going to talk, I am only going to mention about Android, which is the most common 
device in somehow. Device supports, uh, Android supports 464 XLAT since version 5 or something like that, maybe at least five years now. So if you, if you have a lot of CPEs, which are Android 5 or, or newer, you can be sure that they, all of them support IP 464 XLAT. I can tell you also, iPhone uh, is requesting, it is mandatory probably since two years or more now, every application that is uploaded and is installed in the Apple store has to be 100% compatible with IPv6. So if you have Android and iPhone and you have an IPv6 network, everything is going to work just fine. Okay, Alejandro, um, we have, hello, I have a database that only support IPv4. What recommendation should I follow to uh, follow so that the database can access IPv6 server into the LAN and respond to requests from IPv4 host? Wow, that's a very int interesting question. Um, for me, it's very hard to imagine uh, more or less a new software that is only IPv4 capable. It, it, somehow it's very weird. Uh, if I need to, to recommend you something, it's to upgrade that database. But in case you cannot, for whatever reason, it is a very important server, you do not want to touch it. And somehow if something works, please do not touch it. Uh, I fully understand that position. I have, I have been there. I can only tell you that it could be interesting to try to use SEED, for example, since the layer, since what, what, what is going to happen with SEED, with the last transition mechanism that I mentioned? Everything over layer three is going to be copied verbatim. Having said that, if you have a database in one world and you have an another database in another world, in one world is IPv6, in the other one, the other one is IPv4, using SEED should, should make the trick. It could be something very interesting to try. And if you try it, I would love to, to receive a feedback from you, from, from the person that performed the question. Okay. And the last question uh, from Dalia uh, say, if in the same DNS implement IPv4 and IPv6, then in the application server is the dual stack implementation also performed on the same servers or it is recommended that the implementation be done on separate server, servers? Well, I think it is more or less the same question that, that we received at the it's, beginning. It's, it's, it's similar, it's similar. Um, it's similar, but in this case, I I think uh, Dalia asked for uh, also perform to the same server, the performance. Okay, the, the performance to yes. the same server. Yes, okay. the performance. Uh, the performance will be, I'm going to tell you actually the, the reason why. I hope that this answered your question, Dalia. If not, please feel free to, to contact me in case this is not the, probably, the, if, if, if it is not the question that, if it is not the answer that you are looking for. The performance over IPv6 is going to be better. I'm going to tell you why. In this moment, when you have IPv4 connectivity, you are going to have a lot of different devices in the middle. You're going to have many middle boxes. Maybe not you, you are not alone. Maybe your upstream provider, your ISP, the network you are reaching. There are a lot of many middle boxes that in somehow are going to make the transit of your packet slower. For example, even NAT for IPv4, NAT, which is performed very, very fast in our devices. But in somehow it is going to add a latency as much as possible, but it's going to add a latency. Today, if you, for example, make 
trace routes to different destinations in IPv6 and in IPv4, the path in IPv4 is probably 15, 20% longer than the, than a, than the a trace route using IPv6 to the very same network. I mean to the, to the network with the prefix that has IPv4, IPv6 exist. Having said that, the, the, the path, when it is, when you have less hops, and somehow you can assume that it is going to be, to, to, to be faster. And it is actually true. I already mentioned, for example, Facebook data centers, which are IPv6 only, they have reported that the people that access the, their web pages over IPv6 is between 20 and 25% faster than in IPv4. And a very similar result happened with DNS. And I am telling you this because your question, I believe, goes to DNS. Uh, RIPE NCC, they performed a very large study, extensive study, measuring responses in, D, in IPv4 DNS in, and in IPv6 DNS. And in the end, the summary was that IPv6 DNS is about 20% faster than IPv4. So if you are trying to look for reasons to move to IPv6, I hope that I am giving you some, some good reasons to move. Okay, Alejandro, thank you. In this case, I think Dalia can write an email for you. And um, is, is my, is my uh, interpretation of the question is wrong. Okay. Sure, Dalia. Feel free to, to send me an email and I will give you an answer as uh, ASAP. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, um, Alejandro. Um, I, I would like to um, show the last slide. Please. Let me show it. A second, please. Well, thank you for attending the webinar today. On the screen, you can see the contact email. Please feel free to send us any comment or suggestion for our webinars. It's very important for us. In the next day, you will be getting the link with the video of the webinar, of this webinar, sorry. So that's all. Uh, thank you very much and have a nice day. Thank you. Bye bye, everybody. Thank you so bye -bye. much.